Hey there, beloved saints. Uh, well, I really been wanting to do this for the last two days. Uh, last night, I spent some time taking notes. Um, and I decided uh, I will do two, actually three separate videos. But I'm going to consolidate these two topics because they, they work together. Uh, and then in the singular videos, I'll go more into depth. But... I want to answer this. One, th this is one of the big issues I see. Uh, a lot of Christians not walking around in victory, walking around in condemnation, uh, feeling distance from God, and their relationship with God, their emotional relationship, because the relationship is solid. It's all based on Jesus. But the emotional fellowship seems to suffer and it's contingent upon how good they feel they're being that day. Whether they slipped up, whether they did a good work, or whatever. And we, we can't base our relationship with God on us. Because, okay, we, we, just, we have to go to the right foundation. Uh, why we can come boldly, and, and that's an important word, boldly to the throne of grace for help in the time of need. Uh, there's a reason boldly is used there. I don't know if you remember in the Old Testament, uh, they would have to put a bell around the priest's foot in case he dropped dead because he just did something accidentally wrong or, uh, you know, like one time they offered strange fire. There's, there's a lot of reasons that uh, you could stand in front of a holy God and drop dead. One, when they accidentally touched the Ark of the Covenant, trying to keep it from hitting the ground and the guy died. So, Big, big difference now, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. So, the issue I want to discuss here is, who is the Holy Spirit and what does he really do? What, what does he do, right? And secondly, how many times will God forgive you? And I know that sounds silly, but, but we need to answer this. Because there's people out here putting limits and caps on it. And everybody's got their own line drawn in the sand uh, that's different, right? And by the way, it's always the sin they don't have. But I want to uh, go over, because w when we discuss both of these things, you're going to see how they kind of marry. And, and they're very important. And it works, okay? So bear with me here. Now, I, f I feel that the problem with Christians is they're listening to false teachers, one, and not spending time. I'm guilty of it myself, okay? Not putting anybody down. Not spending enough time in the Word with just you and God. That's what you need to be doing. That's what I need to be doing. That's what we all need to be doing, right? And letting God show us these things. And just like anybody else, don't take me blindly either. Check what I say, be a good Berean, and check the scriptures. Uh, I will do my best to give you the scriptures where they are, and which I'm really bad at. I always forget that. Uh, and why I believe they're saying what they say. And I, I'll tell you contextually why, and I'll show you that the best of my ability. Um, but again, uh, you got to take this to God. Now, I, I see them walking around condemned. And religious okay I believe there's a burden of religion hanging on a lot of Christians um, instead of it's been finished it's done you were reconciled to God through Jesus you you have peace with God there, there's nothing for you to do for God to be pleased with you you're his beloved child and it's not because you're good it's because he is okay he is he is love. He loves you, not because you're lovable, but because he is love. So uh, we've got to get this thinking that our emotional fellowship with God is contingent upon how good I am that day. That's a very shaky ground and is dangerous because it can give not just cause for uh, depression and condemnation, but also pride. Pride is a place for pride there. It's very humbling to, you know, there's a, the verses that say, cast your cares upon him. 
It's very difficult and humbling to give it to God. And salvation, above all, is, is the hardest. To hand it over. I, I can't do it. I can't contribute. I can't help. There's nothing I can do. He did it. He saved me. All he asked me to do is believe that he did that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he asked us to do. That's salvation. People can mock it all they want. You're saved by faith. You're saved by God's grace through the vehicle of faith. Now, you can call it easy believism. You can call it whatever you want. But you're saved by God's grace, which you hate, through the vehicle of faith, which you mock. So I don't know. Uh, you know, this is a hypothetical you, not you that are actually watching. Um, I don't know how you're saved by something that you hate and mock. So think about that. If you're saved by grace through faith, yet you hate grace and mock faith because it's easy believism, how are you saved? Why would you receive something you hate and why would you have something that you say is just easy believism? You wouldn't, would you? It's very, very concerning. Very concerning. So, uh, this is the thing. People are walking around condemned because, one, they think the Holy Spirit's job is to convict them of sin. Uh, I beg to differ on that. Uh, we have a conscience for that, by the way. The... Uh, it, did you not, were you not aware that you committed sin before you got saved? Wasn't the Holy Spirit telling you then? What was it? It was your conscience, and it was probably the enemy accusing you as well. So, uh, it's healthy that we know when we're doing wrong, but herein lies the problem. When you walk around defeated, condemned, and think your relationship is based on your performance, you're going to be stuck. And, let me just say, it insults the sacrifice of Jesus. It it really does. There's a section in Hebrews 10, which should be one of the greatest eternal security uh, chapters, but instead is twisted up. It, it turned into something it's not when it's saying, don't waver. Don't trust in the law. Don't trust in these rituals you got to do over and over again. Those were all a shadow. Trust in what Jesus has done. He did it all. Once for all, you're done. It's finished. Right? But they liked their religion. They liked the system of going back and uh, making the sacrifices. They wanted that. Right? Uh, so it's the same thing here. I think a lot of us grew up with religion and we are used to it. Uh, we don't know how to just be okay. That we're God's beloved child. It's done. It's finished. I see this with a lot of Catholics that get saved on here. Uh, the first year or two, it's very, very difficult because they're used to these rituals. You know, the, well, I go to Mass uh, three times a week. And then they go do their, do it, go to the Mass. They feel better. Or they'll go do their rituals or they'll go to confession. And they feel like, mm, I'm good with God now. And I feel good. Well, they don't have those things anymore. And it's very difficult for them. And I think it works the other way, too. People can get this religious mind. And I think that's what's happening. And so let us we're going to let the Bible speak for us, okay? So let's answer the question, how many times will God forgive you? And, and what if you, like, have this sin? Let's say you had an anger issue, right? And you keep telling God, oh, God, I'm going to do better. I'm gonna, by the way, this never works. New Year's resolutions to God never work. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is say, oh, I'm helpless, but you know what? I know who I am in Christ. I am the beloved, highly favored child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And that is what we need to be confessing. See, confession is not just confessing sin. That has been twisted up. It means to agree with what God says is true in the scriptures. Confession made to salvation. And that doesn't mean eternal salvation. It's to deliverance, rescue. So, um, you know, it. all right, we're, we're going to start there. How many times 
will God forgive us? Let's say you got an anger problem and uh, you, you keep saying, I'm going to do better, but you, you lost your temper and you raised your voice or you made an ugly hand sign to a guy driving next to you, something, right? Every day you're dealing with this anger issue and it's a habitual sin. How many times is, is God going to forgive you for that? What, what if you just, uh, I'm just, you know, and just get used to it. You keep doing it. What is God going to keep forgiving you? How many times? Well, I'll tell you how many times God will forgive you. Do you remember when Jesus said, uh, when they asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother who, you know, uh, who does something to me? And he said, uh, seven times. He said, no, 70 times seven. Now, obviously he wasn't, it was hyperbole. He wasn't saying, uh, uh once you get to 70 times seven, 490 or whatever it was, uh, you got to stop forgiving them. That, that wasn't the point. Uh, it just meant over and over again. Right. And that was what Jesus said for the disciples to do. So, how many times will God forgive us? It tells us how many times. Once. That's not bad news, people. That's great news. See, God forgave you already. So how many times will God forgive you? One time. Because it's enough. He forgave you all trespasses. And you've been perfected. Once for all. Okay, under the old covenant, every year they would have to make the animal sacrifice, right, for the sin. So they have to have a memory or a remembrance, not not a list of, oh, I did this wrong on December 18th. And I did, not like that, okay, not the confession that the Catholics have. This is the remembrance that I have failed God for that year. I don't, I don't know them all, but I felt so. But bringing up the sin remembrance, right? The To the comers there too perfect is what it's talking about. The comers there too. When they came to the high priest, they had to remember or recall and admit that they had sinned. Okay, that's a remembrance of sin. They're bringing it up in order to be atoned for, right? Uh, by the sacrifice of the animal. But Jesus purged our sins. Purged them. Gone. You know, to purge something, uh, it, it means to get it out. So, uh, it was done. And that's what people can't seem to get here. So, during the Old Covenant, it seems to me that this religious thinking is similar. It's we, we want to keep doing something, keep having to come back to God and confess, keep having. Now, he is our father. We talk to him. We tell him things. If we feel like we failed or we stumbled on our walk or we, we could have gotten better, talk to your father. Tell him, I didn't like how that felt, but praise Jesus, I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Every time I mess up, it just reminds me how much I need your grace. And thank you so much, uh, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me so that I, I know. I can be at peace with you and have this relationship with you. That's our attitude. Not, you know, oh, uh, I'm just a filthy sinner. No, that guy died, okay? That sinner, that, that dead, he's dead. The old man is dead and gone. You were created a new uh, creature in Christ. All things have become new. And I, again, I say this all the time that people think it means I used to be bad. Now I'm good. That's not what it means. It's a spiritual concept. Remember when it says, a uh, natural man receiveth not the things of God, they're spiritually discerned? That's why. And this is what happened. That's why they don't understand it's so permanent. A re recreation occurred. The spirit man was dead, right? But he's been quickened, brought to life in Christ. He's alive now, and he has, how long? Everlasting life, by the way. That's the new man created in righteousness and true holiness, as it says in Christ Jesus. Then you have the old man. He's dead. So that old, rotten, filthy sinner saved by grace, dead guy, gone, dead. And we're not supposed to walk in him, right? So that is the difference. We've got to know who we were and who we are. Confessing who we are now in Christ gives honor 
to the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If we belittle what it accomplished, if we're constantly questioning, if we're always, we're, then that means we don't have confidence in his blood. It says faith in his blood. It's important, but we seem to not have any faith in his blood. It's like some supplement for our own righteousness or something. So we've got to understand he forgave you once, and that's all that's needed. He, he's not holding you. When it says God will remember their sins no more, he's not going to remember your It's not that he forgot them. It's, he's never, you, just like you said, you'll have a remembrance of sin again every year. I mean, he's not recalling them. He's not putting them on your account. He's not associating or attributing them to you, the new creature. Okay, the the sin that's committed, to, and and you know I'll answer like Paul because this is the accusation that comes immediately. Well, shall we sin so grace may abound? God forbid. How can we, being dead to sin, live any more therein? That guy died. Now we need to remember that. That's how we get victory. That's not who I am anymore. Oh, does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. But Paul says. Uh, put off concerning the old man and put on the new one and walk in the truth confessing in agreement what the Bible says we are we're beloved children of God we're the righteousness of God in Christ we are holy and blameless highly favored blessed elect of God you, you got to confess these things and that means to agree now I'm not talking about uh, you know the word of faith movement and all that mess I'm talking about get in agreement with what God says about you. All right? So, he forgives you once, and that's all that's needed. And we need to do a video on temporal, earthly consequences versus eternal. Because a lot of people don't understand you can be saved and suffer these things. A lot of people think King Saul was lost. No, he wasn't. The Spirit departed from him. In regards to ruling the nation all right so let's um, let's go over to John chapter 16 now mainly the scriptures that I have are in Hebrews John and Romans I think I have something in Ephesians but uh, I think I'll just do that by memory all right so go to John 16 now these are Jesus's words it says but because I've said these things unto you saying that he's gonna leave Sorrow has, oh minute, I just scrolled up there. Sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. So there's one thing the Holy Spirit does. He comforts. He comforts us. He confirms who we are in Christ. And see, when you're constantly confessing who you are, if you constantly are telling yourself that you are royalty, wouldn't you just stand up a little bit straighter? And it's the same thing. If you're constantly going, oh, I'm just a, a old alcoholic. Uh, I could relapse any day. You keep saying that, and 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 you're going to focus on it. You keep saying, uh, I can't, I can't get over this habitual sin I have. I'm just this. I'm that. Just stop. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. And you keep agreeing with that. And you're going to say, wait a minute, the new person here doesn't touch that. It, and eventually, you won't want it. It'll decrease. It's when you're, when you're, when you're feeding the spirit and not the flesh, it'll get less and less strong. Okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that we're perfect or any of that. I'm just saying you're not going to get victory until you understand that God already forgave you. You're in right standing with God. You're his beloved child. Salvation is a done deal, all based on Jesus. He wants you to know that. And he, tell, he gives us these instructions to have a heart in full assurance of faith. And, and what an insult it is. Uh, and belittling the sacrifice of Jesus to act like that's not enough or you're somehow keeping it or you're gonna it's just religion 
It's all it is. It's all it is. And let me tell you, ooh, religious people hate me and they hate this message. They do not like this message because it, you can just come. It's not about you or how you're living or any of it because your relationship is based on Jesus, not you. Now, does that produce more sin in your life? No, it doesn't. It's the constant focus on sin and law that strengthens sin because the strength of sin is the law. So if they got it backwards. The constant focus on legalism, condemnation, that, that is what is creating the struggle. But agreeing with God who you are in Christ, that gives you strength to actually walk it out. So Jesus continues here and he, he calls the Holy Spirit, capital C, Comforter. So that's one of the things he does. He comforts us. And he says, the comforter will not come unto you unless I go away. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove who of sin? The world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, why? Why? Because they drink too much and fornicate? No, because they believe not on me. So wh what is the Holy Spirit doing? He is convicting the unsaved of the fact that they are sinners in need of a Savior, and they need to believe on Christ. So he's bearing witness to who Jesus is and what he's done. That's why to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is not possible for a believer, because it means to constantly reject Jesus uh, with the Holy Spirit bearing witness over and over and over again to you, and you still reject the truth. So, um, you see here, it's, it has nothing to do with uh, condemning the believer and constantly making the believer sin conscience. We don't need that. We already know when we're failing. <laughs> and I, I never get that uh, from him condemning voice anyway. It's more like that's not who you are. I, I don't get the condemnation anymore. And, uh, oh, it, it'll sneak back in now. I've got to constantly be in the Word. If I'm not in the Word for a while, I can get frazzled. I can tell you that. Uh, so, when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. And you'll see that in, I think it's First John, where he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us, right? This is what his job is to do. He's telling the unbeliever, you are a sinner. There was literally Pharisees, I'm sure, uh, claiming, just that's why John wrote it, that they don't sin or there was no such thing as sin, etc., etc. Or I, you know, I keep the law perfectly. All of these I've kept since my youth up. What lack I yet? Remember that guy? So a lot of people thought they didn't sin. And there's still people today claiming I haven't sinned in 10 years. I still, I can't even say that with a straight face. I don't know how they do it. All right. So the sin that he's re re reproving is unbelief. All right. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So we are constantly confirmed by the comforter who we are in Christ. Not this constant sin consciousness, but who we are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. For instance, why don't you go to any epistle by Paul and see what Paul does? Yeah, he goes and he corrects the church when there's crazy behavior, like when they're doing temple prostitution and one guy's having an affair with his father's wife and crazy stuff like that. Oh, he corrects the bad behavior, and we're not against that. We believe in that, too. But he confirms always God's love for them, who they used to be is not who they are now, how their sins are forgiven, how everything that they have, the hope that's before them, he's always reaffirming this hope, this truth. Preachers aren't doing that. They're condemning. They're making it about you. But Paul constantly, constantly uh, had them 
uh, stand strong uh, in faith in Jesus. It's just him. So we can see that he is also the spirit of truth here. When the, he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Uh, so he's always going to bear witness to Jesus. He's always going to elevate Jesus. He's always going to lift Jesus up. He's always going to confirm what he did on Calvary was enough. If I'm, I'm so sick of these people claiming to be prophets and prophetesses, uh, saying the Holy Spirit said this and the Spirit of the Lord told me, and that is not his voice. A bunch of condemnation, a bunch of belittling of the blood of Jesus. It just wasn't enough. Some loophole where God's going to make you unborn somehow and the new creation is going to be unmade. Do you see how crazy that is? Do you, we need to do something on what happened when you got saved. Like, I've done videos similar, but we need to do one to say this is what happened. This is another reason it's impossible for you to lose it because you've been recreated into something new and if you look into the uh, old language it's a whole new thing that that guy the dead guy gone the flesh guy we reckon him dead that guy was dead but the new man has been recreated into something completely new created in the likeness of Jesus that's who we are why are we condemning ourselves when he says we're we're in him as he is so are we in this world we got to get this so we're never gonna grow the world doesn't need more religion it's got plenty of it and it doesn't save it doesn't save and i know it's a cliche of it's a relationship with jesus and a lot of people say that but i'm telling you i am the least religious person there is I love the Lord and I love the scriptures so you know it's the religious will always hate it uh, a lot of them won't won't even understand some of this they'll just hear license to sin and this and they won't hear it as the good news they won't hear that God's great love actually uh, does not promote sin it's actually their religiosity and law that promotes more sin but they they, they won't understand that so I can only speak to those that can hear me, you know, and I know I can be difficult to take. I can be rough around the edges. If you don't like me, I'm happy to give you uh, some really good, real gospel gentlemen that are great preachers. Don't, don't, don't not get saved because you don't like me. You don't have to like me. I'm just a, a mouthpiece here, uh, but I'll be happy to give you some um, great men of God that can lead you and answer your questions. So, uh, let me see here. Oh, I'm hoping I didn't mess up. Hold on. Okay, sorry. All right, so let me close this one out. I want to read this to you. Just a little reminder, okay? In Romans 5, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, which, you know, they mock, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. You hear that? Wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, hope in the Bible is a sure future possession. Biblical hope is not, mm, maybe you might, oh, I hope so. It's not like that. Biblical hope is a sure future possession. Okay? Uh, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. Uh, and it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Did he die for sensible sinners? For the ungodly. We were all ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man one will die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But see, he died for the worst. He died for the ones mocking him. He tasted death for every man, the worst of us. 
He tasted death for every man. How could you lose it? He tasted death for you. W was that in vain? Much more than. Now, much more. Being now justified. Now, I like what Ralph Yankee Arnold says. Just as if I'd never sinned. And that's true. Justified means to be declared righteous in the sight of God. Not, not made righteous through your own actions, but declared based on nothing you've done. You've been declared righteous. Your, your faith has been counted to you for righteousness, just like Abraham. You know why? Because we believe God, just like Abraham. We believe that what Jesus did on Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection, it paid our sin debt. Uh, he ascended to the Father, and we, we're being reconciled to God. We have eternal life because of the shed blood of Christ. That's it. We believe him. We take him at his word. That's believing the gospel, people, knowing you're saved. And if you don't know that, you're not believing the gospel. And there's a lot of people around here claiming to be Christians that aren't even believers. As a matter of fact, they mock believing. It's easy believism. Work your way to hellism for all I care. I don't care. I'm not even going to, uh, uh, I can't worry with them anymore. You know, it's, it's so grieving when they mock what he endured as cheap. I just, I get so upset. I'm like, it's, and it's stupid too. Because if I gave you an expensive gift because it was free for you, because that's what a gift is. It's cheap because you didn't pay for it. Well, what about what I paid for it? I paid a lot for it. It's not cheap. What an insult to me. I'm the one that gave you the gift. Can you imagine? God gives you his son. He suffers that terrible. We call it cheap. That's what bought it. That's what purchased us. That's not cheap. It says it, it, we were bought with, with something far greater than uh, gemstones and gold. But the precious blood of Jesus, it's not cheap. It's just an insult. And it's just them parroting. Parroting what they hear. I don't even think they know what they're saying. So, and it says, much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Temporal. Temporal. Okay? For if, when we were enemies... We were, see how this is past this? We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. What reconciled us to God? The death of his son. Not confessing, not repenting. You did repent. The minute you said, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I got to trust Jesus and what he did. You did repent. You changed your mind. Stop trusting in you and your dead works of the law. And you started trusting in Jesus Christ. So that is how we're saved. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So you can be saved from a lot of things. And not only so, but we also joy in God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now received, again, past tense, the atonement. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I don't know why that's confusing for people. They just don't believe it, that's why. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace that they mock. There it is, people. The gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses, all the sins, unto justification 
For by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that's what I want you to see, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I am so sick of this obey, obedience, another way of saying it's your works. Should we obey the Lord? Of course we should. But what's the one thing he tells us we got to do to be saved? What they won't do. Simply believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the one thing you got to do. We do. We do. But they still want to make it about how much you're obeying the command. They use everything except the law. They Except for the word law, they'll, they'll do it every kind of call it every other such thing. It still works. And although we all agree that uh, there's a way a Christian should uh, conduct the, their lives, that's not the issue here. We're talking about salvation and the attitude we should have of walking in our identity in Christ rather than this uh, beaten down, condemned, sin conscious. You know, it's just, it's not how we're supposed to be all right uh it tells us paul tells us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind that we put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness you see it's a new creature we need to walk in that truth this isn't something we're striving to become it's who we are in christ now walk like it you see you're not trying to become it you are it now manifest it that's the way it's supposed to be but they got it backwards they're telling you to act a certain way to be something and he's telling you, you already are something i created you as that realize it and walk out that truth okay um and put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness that cannot be undone now this little section in colossians i'll read that last but it's telling you, don't get caught up in people telling you that you're not complete in Christ. You're complete in Him. Don't get caught up in the rudiments of the world. You got to keep the Sabbath. You got to eat this. You got to do that. If you want to do it, great. If you see it as shadows of Jesus, and it has more meaning for you, go right ahead. But don't don't think that that's some kind of giving you brownie points to be saved or something, because that's that's not the case. Uh, and he was like, we're complete. We're complete in Jesus. Everything, all of that was shadows of him. All right, now, this is the section I want you to see for uh, the once for all completeness that we have in Christ, okay? I, I've gone over Hebrews 10 so much. The, the whole thing here, you can just look at the first sentence and it tells you what the context is. The law was just a shadow. That's all. Stop putting trust in it and stop belittling the sacrifice of Jesus. It only needed to be done one time, and it's done once for all. It's not every year continually like the animals, and then every year you gotta keep remembering your sin. We don't remember it anymore. God's not remembering it. Again, it's not that he forgot, it's he's not recalling it, he's not bringing it and attaching it to you. You're his beloved child. Uh, he sees you in, in Christ, Jesus in your place you're the new creature he's not uh, attributing these things to you he's not holding them against you for all eternity that doesn't mean that if we do something terrible here we won't have consequence we have earthly consequence for it okay i'm talking about eternal damnation is not a consequence for a believer okay so Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Now this chapter tells us we have been perfected forever 
That's why I have my hat on right now. Perfected. Can you say it? Gonna say it. Steffi got these made. Uh, I was able to get um, some of them out to you guys a couple years ago. I just love it. She made this one. She made the blue one. So, Jesus plus nothing. Remember that. And I'm thinking of getting some made for this ministry. I think it'd be good. You know, and every now and then somebody will ask about it. The Jesus plus nothing perfected forever. I love it. I love it. It's the gospel, like, uh, crunched down, you know, condensed. All right. So it says, uh, those sacrifices never made people perfect, right? For then they would have ceased to be offered. They wouldn't have had to keep making them, right? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. Now, what is the implication here? Those people, they had a remembrance constantly of their sins, again, that God needed to to be reconciled uh, uh, with them again because of their sin over and over again, right? So they have to recall their sin again after the next year. But now that that's not necessary. It, you can't because it insults the blood of Jesus. Listen, it says, because the worship, worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. You see that? So what, what he gets to here is that we should have no more conscien conscience of sin in the sense that God is holding them against us. And so we need to do these for them, the rituals and the sacrifices. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. It's been done. Jesus already did it once for all. God's not accepting anything else. That's why there remains, if you sin willfully, by rejecting him and his once-for-all sacrifice. That's what the willful sin here is. This makes me crazy how they twist that up. It is so clear what that's about. Uh, if, if you reject that, if you willfully sin by rejecting his once-for-all sacrifice and try to uh, get it through some other sacrifice, there is no more sacrifice for sin. God's not going to accept it. Because he died once for all. Okay, that's what he's trying to say. It's done. It's finished. He forgave you once. Because that's all he needed to forgive. And God already knew the end from the beginning. He knew what you were going to do. You don't think Jesus bore the sin of the future? I, I didn't live 2,000 years ago. Of course, he, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's what it says. So if his blood didn't pay for future sin, then everybody's lost. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Nothing else pays for it. Not No repentance, no penance, no nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only blood pays for sin. So if his blood didn't cover it all, we're all lost. Every one of us. But it's clear in Hebrews that it did because he died once for all. It just tells you here that they used to have to make the sacrifices year by year continually and it never made the comers there and too perfect, which implies what? We are perfected forever. The comers have been made perfect through the one-time sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to know. All right? So, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. See, it covered them, didn't take them away. Jesus purged them, though. It says, wherefore, when he cometh to the world, okay, that's a quote from the Old Testament. I'm just going down. Uh, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I need you guys to hear that. We were sanctified that's made holy once for all set apart cleansed made holy by god and for god because of his sacrifice not not anything else we're doing so just i said before like the the temple the showbread table that was sanctified it's a table it's an inanimate object it can't act holy to be holy it is holy because it's consecrated. It's 
set apart and sacred. And so are we. And it's by his blood. It's all through Jesus. It's all what he did. It's all through his blood. I just, I don't know why uh, there's so much opposition against this. So it says, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. So forever, would that include the future? I think so. Forever. Because I'm sick of this. It's only past sins. Past from when? From the moment you believe? Okay, wait till you almost die before you believe. So all of them are covered. Pass from, I mean, it, it just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's so clear in the book of Hebrews that it is not just from now in the past. It's all of them because the blood has to be shed in order to pay for the sin. Nobody can have sin on their account. And if there's no blood, no forgiveness. So if it's not applied to the future, we're all lost. And it says, but this man, because it says every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And that doesn't mean that we're walking holy. That sanctified, it just told you, by the offering of Jesus' body. Those that have received the blood on their behalf. So, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So now you can see the context here. They don't need to keep making offerings for sin because Jesus did it once for all. We've been perfected forever. Okay, that's what he's trying to get them to see. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. See, not the old Levitical law, but a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Even that was a, a shadow. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and i want to stop there i need you to see that part hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering what what does that mean he wants you to have confidence that it's done you've been reconciled to god that, well, for them, that the sacrifices are no longer necessary because Jesus died once for all. You've been made holy, sanctified, set apart for God, by God. You're his beloved child. All of that, okay? And he wants us to have a true heart in full assurance of faith. Does it sound like he wants you to question or wonder? No, it's an insult that it was his blood enough. And when it says an evil conscience... So, and God says, the religion tells you, oh no, you got to walk around dejected and sin conscious all the time and confessing your sin all the time. And by the way, that confess your sins is not a, a confession like the cat. It, it's to admit you're a sinner because if you don't do that, you can't be saved because he saves sinners. So you got to admit you're a sinner. And some people actually believe they didn't sin. So that's what that's about. Uh... We don't run around, you know, now, uh, when it's talking about confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed, that has nothing to do with uh, eternal salvation anyway. So we've got to apply these things uh, correctly in the right context. So having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and these sprinkling references, this is all Old Testament sacrificial terms, uh, and, and it's pretty amazing if you study it. Uh, but holding fast, the profession of our faith without 
wavering. He doesn't want you wavering. He doesn't want you wondering. He doesn't want you unsure. For why? For he is faithful that promised. See, that's why we have security. Because God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. He promised us eternal life. And Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe thou this? Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you. You should too. It's really that simple. Man, the enemy doesn't want you to get this. He's still tearing me up. I just had something go wrong in my car two days ago. I was like waiting for it. Okay, this happens and then the car. And then this happens and then the car. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. But that's all right. I, it, it, it held me up a little bit, but I still got here. I still did it. So I'm making it a priority. It, it doesn't matter what gets in my way or causes a delay. I, I'm doing my ministry. I had to come back uh, full force here. And, uh, you know, there's something. Somebody don't want me doing it. I'm going to tell you that. I don't believe it's the Lord. So uh, this is the main thing I wanted you to see. You need to have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin because they don't believe. Okay? He's the comforter and he convicts us of our righteousness. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. Our right standing of our new identity, of our relationship as a beloved child of the living God. Because that encourages godly living. When you know who you are in Jesus, it doesn't promote sin. That's it. That none of that even makes sense because Paul even said, "Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law; you're under grace." So, grace actually uh, promotes Jesus-focused living, and that's what we need to be. See, the whole evil conscience is self-centered. Me, 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 what I didn't do, what I didn't do right. It's all about you. But Jesus-centered, that's important. Uh, so I'll do a, a detailed uh, video on each one of these subjects, but hopefully you could see how we had to meld them together. You know, how many times will God forgive you and uh, what, what does the Holy Spirit do? Because... The, this is really important. If you think the Holy Spirit's con condemning you constantly and convicting you of sin all day long, that's not really, uh, I mean, we have a conscience. That's not really his job. He's the comforter. He's the teacher. Now, he'll teach you and instruct you in the ways of righteousness, but it doesn't come with a condemning voice. Uh, it, it confirms who you are. And it always lifts up Jesus. That's why when these prophets come and tell me, uh, oh, he said you, uh, the Lord had a word for you, and he said you can lose salvation, and you better. And I was like, the Lord didn't tell you none of that. You need to stop. And by the way, he can tell me himself. He don't need to tell you. He can tell me. So it's it's all it's not his voice. It's not his voice. You know, my sheep know my voice. They hear me and they follow me. And another they won't follow. So, it, you know, discernment doesn't come immediately when you're a babe. It really does come when you've spent a lot of time in the Word. When you when you take time studying the Word, it, it's not something that, that comes right away. So, we cannot say a person isn't saved because they don't understand. I don't understand a lot of stuff. It's... It's when the basics aren't understood. And not only are they not understood, they're hated. Like our blessed assurance, the blood of Jesus, uh, why we're a new creature, why it can't be undone, why salvation is by his grace through faith alone. That That's it. We believe God and he counts it to us for righteousness. You know, these things are, are going to, the religious, they're not going to get it. The lost man won't get it. And Jesus said, said so. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So people, they're, they're not his sheep. They can't, they can't hear him. And that's why they mock it. And that's why they hate it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not anybody's judge. Uh, I just wish everybody 
would believe this is the greatest news in the world. And the main thing that I'm worried about is there's there's babes in Christ having their joy stolen and getting confused. And not just babes, man. I've seen people saved many years getting confused by like Ray Comfort and John MacArthur or Paul Washer because they're so sincere and they're theologians and it, it, they're very confused. They get sucked into it. And it's very sneaky because they use the right terminology, but they redefine those words. And so they sound right, but something's off. And it's, it's just very, very sneaky. Okay, guys. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know what? I, I, I want to say, why don't you guys tonight, as believers, why don't we all read Hebrews chapter 10 tonight? And remember the context. Just reread the first, first line of uh, chapter 10, and it'll bring the context right back to you. You know, the law having a shadow of good things to come. So, um, because there is a lot in this chapter to really confirm your faith uh, and to help strengthen you. You've been perfected forever. So let go of that evil conscience and have a heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith. All right, you guys. God bless.